Hi, my name is Alex Komninos. I'm a doctoral candidate at Justus Liebig University Gießen in Germany. I'm also with the Association for Progressive Communications, so I guess I'm wearing the academic hat, wearing the civil society hat, and I also like to wear the netizen hat. I think that's an important stakeholder. Great, so join me in welcoming the, the panel, and thank you very, very much for attending. We, we really appreciate having uh, such an esteemed group of people here. Um, I think one of the things about the IGF is actually having a multi-stakeholder environment. And if you look across the group, we actually have representatives from all of the major components of, of our sector. So it's great to see. Uh, I actually want to kick off the discussion today um, looking at the most recent uh, shutdown that I'm aware of, uh, which, which took place in Sudan. Um, Anya Kovacs was actually going to be on the panel, but uh, she's unwell and very pleased to have Dahlia join at, la at the last minute. Uh, as she mentioned, she's from Sudan, which is going to give us a, a, a better sense of the, some of the issues from the user perspective. Um, so there's, the Sydney shutdown uh, happened uh, on the 25th and the 26th of September. Um, so that's less than four weeks ago. So we're talking about something that's pretty live, uh, but obviously I think there are also a number of shutdowns and certainly network disruptions that are taking place as we speak. Um, but let's kick off with, with Sudan. Um, um, we saw from uh, the, the Renesis reports uh, and also from Arbor Networks that essentially the Sudanese internet was um, cut off from the rest of the internet. And I don't know if people have seen the graphs from Rensis and Arbor Networks, but they're basically like a cliff. It just goes straight like that, straight down. We saw it, of course, with Egypt and also with Syria over the last couple of years. Um, and Access did some investigation as to what happened in, in, in that shutdown. Um, and we could certainly tell from each of the four telcos um, that operate within Sudan um, which is uh, MTN Sudan, uh, Sudatel, Zane Sudan, and Kanar Telecom, um, that all of them essentially went off at the same point. Uh, and yet the response from the Sudanese government was very different. At one level you had the, the US ambassador in, uh, in, in the Sudanese ambassador in the US talking of a, uh, a fire in Kanar Telecom, uh, and yet we also had the Sudanese minister um, talking about uh, saying it was a, a deliberate and government uh, um, government shutdown, and so that kind of like inconsistency of response was, was certainly confusing. But from a technical perspective, it certainly appeared as if the shutdown took place with the consent uh, and um, by the proactive actions of the the Sudanese uh, telcos. Um, and so, um, Dali, maybe we can hear f from you as to what the experience was, was like um, and how your fellow countrymen actually responded to the Khartoum shutdown uh, and, and what, what sort of response you would like to see from the telcos, in fact. Um, of course, my perspective is going to be the perspective of the civil society and uh, the human rights activists on the ground. Um, I belong to a youth movement called Girifna that was founded in 2009, and it's basically a protest movement, uh, a peaceful protest movement on the ground. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what triggered um, the shutdown for 24 hours on September uh, 25th. And it's ironic that the shutdown actually happened during the Africa IGF. Um, uh, Basically, uh, a week before that, the government had announced that it's going to lift economic state subsidies on um, gasoline and other basic food stuff. And the day before, um, uh, two days before, uh, there was a national... <laughs> That's right, that's a network interference. Go on. Um, okay, so basically the, 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 the reasons for, for the um, uh, closure were this announcement of um, an austere, economic austerity measures and the government lifting um, subsidies on basic foodstuff and especially gasoline. So um, 
The day before the protest, you had the doubling of the price of gasoline that basically led to the increase, massive increase of basic uh, food stuff. And it came after a couple of months of a deteriorating economic situation that was touching the livelihood of the majority of the population. Um, when these protests started, I think the government was very surprised at how different they were from the protests that happened a year ago that were mainly led by university students and um, youth movement leaders. These protests were very grassroots. Uh, they started in Wad Madani, a little bit south of Khartoum, and then they spread uh, to the suburbs of Khartoum, and then eventually it was even the middle class protesting for the first time in the 24-year history of uh, the regime uh, in place. Uh, and it seemed that th the, the, the reaction uh, or the, um, uh, the, the reaction of the police, the reaction of the government militias and uh, national security was basically shoot to kill. Uh, within the first three days of the protest, there were um, more than 200 people dead just in the capital, most of them very young um, uh, secondary school students, um, uh, uh, youth in their early 20s. Uh, and a lot of it was very, very well documented. Um, you had just normal citizens for the first time uh, picking up their, their phones and, and their videos and documenting in a very graphic way um, the deaths of their, their colleagues in the streets. Uh, I think this is the real trigger for the government, just like a massive movement of uh, um, citizen journalists who were not really political in the past. They're just apolitical citizens who decided that it's time to move. Um, and when the shutdown d did happen, the first people who noticed it were those who were monitoring the situation. So um, for us, it's very hard to believe the government saying that there was uh, some natural disaster because it was very systematic. The f first people who lost, uh, uh, who started to report this were the ones who were trying to upload videos and uh, go on Facebook, etc. A lot of the youthful population is nowadays um, only using its phone to access the internet. Uh, so. Um, uh, those of us who were outside the country, for instance, suddenly had no connection from the inside. Um, uh, Canal, which was where the government is claiming that there was a fire, is actually a provider that only provides for businesses because it only gives landlines. So it was irrelevant for the majority of the population that Canal was not working um, because it's only businesses or really households who have landlines, and the majority don't have landlines. Uh, the other thing is that right after when this happened, uh, we also noticed that even SMS messages were, uh, were disrupted, uh, and it was not only the internet, uh, it was disrupted for almost the same amount of uh, the 24 hours or a little bit less. Um, and also uh, SMS for Twitter, which was a service that uh, only one provider was, um, uh, was giving, and it's Zane, uh, uh, mainly it's a Kuwaiti-owned uh, uh, telecom. Uh, and finally, I'd like to say that this is not the first interruption uh, for the internet in Sudan, but it is definitely the longest, and that's why it got a lot of international attention. In the protest of last year, in 2012, the summer of 2012, we also saw an interruption of a few hours um, on June 29th, and it was the day before big protests were announced the following day, on June uh, 30th. Uh, this year, in 2013, also uh, at, in, in June of 2013, uh, a big protest was, an, was uh, planned by a political party, um, and also on the eve or, or during that protest, for eight hours, uh, Renis also reported that uh, the Sudatel network was down uh, for, for, for that time. Um, uh, so that's just to give you the, uh, 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 an idea of usually the trigger is, is political activity linked to protests on the ground or unexpected uh, political as upheaval uh, or unexpected mobilization by youth or political parties uh, or in this case it was just normal citizens uh, using a lot of social media to communicate because on the ground, the situation of freedom of expression is really bad. Uh, since the separation of South Sudan, we've had the closure of about 16 newspapers. That is hard, um, uh, hard copy circulation newspapers. We've had more than 20 um, uh, journalists being either detained or banned from writing. Um, and this, this means that a lot of these newspapers, a lot of these journalists, and a lot of citizen journal, uh, journalists are moving uh, to hoping that there is more freedom on 
online, but these infringements offline are coming to the online uh, domain um, as well. Um, uh, and that's part of the reason why in the last couple of years you're, you're seeing more of the population uh, going online because the situation of freedom of association, freedom to assemble um, uh, freely and to protest freely is really repressive. Thank you. Dalia, thank you very much and thank you for so um, honestly and um, <clears throat> clearly explaining the situation. Can I get a sense from you and from your understanding from other members of civil society, do, do you know what actually took place in terms of how the government related to the telecom sector in terms of the enabling of the shutdown? Do you have a sense of that? Um, well, I have to say, us as a civil society, uh, maybe it's kind of a shortcoming from us that we don't have yet strong relationship or know how to forge uh, a debate with um, the telecoms and the private sector in general. Uh, and maybe this is kind of uh, a lesson learned from these couple of experiences of the shutdown. But we have heard, we know, for instance, that um, uh, we've got three gateways uh, uh, to the international uh, um, uh, internet. Uh, one is owned by Sudaten, which is 20% uh, at least we know they say it's 20%, but some of us believe it's much higher than 20% ownership by the government. Yeah. Um, and then the rest are uh, Canal, which is Emirati, Zain, which is Kuwaiti, and MTN, which is South African. Uh, and from hearing from Sudaten, uh, when, we, when they've been asked in the past how do they uh, respond to government requests, uh, and it's, it's general because the government taps the phones of, uh, um, of uh, politicians and activists. It's, uh, it's, it's survey, it does surveillance. It has a cyber jihadist unit that is um, hacking personal accounts of activists and, and Facebooks and, and, and yeah. filtering and blocking, etc. So, so when, they're at, when they're approached to the question, how do re you react when a government requests, the, they, they say that they usually require um, uh, legal written documents, um, but in a country like Sudan where the rule of law is not really in place, where the judiciary is not independent, I don't think that is uh, a proper justification. Yeah. It's not very convincing. Um, and, and I think there, re there were a lot of rumors that after the shutdown that there was going to be another extended shutdown for 48 hours. It never happened, and we believe the reason it didn't happen was that there was pressure from other private sector entities like the banking system that was basically totally stopped for 24 hours um, and that other private sector entities were really impacted by this that it was impossible to have a total closure. Uh, when the internet did come back, it came back very slow. Um, some uh, applications were impossible to access online like YouTube and the, the uploading of videos. Um, Facebook was very hard to access on um, smartphones. So it came back with a much lesser uh, capacity. You've raised so many issues there that I, I'd like to pick up on. I mean, one in particular, I think, is um, the nature of the ownership of the telecoms. And I think we'll see this in many countries, is that, in fact, the, 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 the telcos are, are subsidiaries of other uh, companies and are part owned by government and also um, often by European companies. It's great to have Eve here, and we'll have get a response from him on that issue later on, um, particularly given the guiding principles which talk, the, the, the industry dialogue guiding principles which talk about the way in which uh, companies and their subsidiaries um, should be held to the same standards and uh, that are contained in the document. Um, the other issue I think is extremely important that you raise is the one of transparency. Um, you say you don't know what happened necessarily. You don't have a relationship with the telcos. Um, and I think one of the things that certainly within the Access um, Telco Action Plan and also in the industry dialogue guiding principles, it talks about transparency of process. Um, when are the conditions are there any conditions, and we'll, we'll hear um, from Emma on this, are there conditions in which a shutdown is appropriate? Um, and if so, what, what is the transparent process that needs to take place in order for that shutdown to happen? Um, so why don't we, why don't we hear um, from Emma, and maybe you can give us a sense of hearing from Dahlia um, about what took place in, in Sudan, not just this time, but previously. How does this fit into the pattern of shutdown and network disruptions that you've seen across the world? 
I, mean, I think what, what Dahlia is explaining it, or the, the scenario she's describing are um, one of the, the key justifications that governments give when they're uh, enacting network shutdowns, be it interruption of mobile service, um, shutdowns of the internet, or temporary slowing or other throttling of service. Um, it, it, the justifications come from the sense of a need to calm unrest or, or maintain public order for the benefit of public safety, but it, it occurs around these times of protest, times where people are trying to use communication networks to organize, and the action of causing the network shutdown is intended to prevent the, the unrest caused by people organizing for the purpose of political protest. Um, another common justification we see from governments is that shutting down networks, particularly mobile networks, is necessary to prevent specific acts of terrorism, concerns about bombs that will be triggered by use of cell phones in cell phone networks. Um, we've, you know, we've seen uh, the government of Pakistan, I think in November 2012, uh, justifying a mobile network shutdown on this basis. Um, we also saw um, the, the Port Authority in um, New York and New Jersey and the United States using a similar justification all the way back in 2005 to justify shutting down cell phone network service to several of the um, tunnels connecting New York and New Jersey, uh, taking the sense of needing to shut down the networks uh, because there's concerns about triggering a bomb. These shutdowns lasted two weeks. Um, the, the sense of trying to um, stop an imminent threat uh, when, when you see network shutdowns kind of persisting much past any period of that you could reasonably define as imminent, um, it starts also raising concerns about you know, what, what's really behind the justification um, that, that governments are presenting. But I think a key, um, a key sort of thing to think about as we're, we're talking about, what, well, no, I guess I'll let <laughs> Brett make the segue. <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I was actually thinking as you were speaking about um, the, the, the kind of justification for a shutdown. Um, and I think many of the people in the audience and also on the panel know about Frank LaRue's reports to the, the Human Rights Council and to the General Assembly about um, surveillance and about monitoring of networks and about interference with basic human rights. And he actually sets out the, the reasons why he thinks that the blocking access um, to the internet is really justified. And a lot of it is actually about this question of is it provided by law domestically? Um, but then there's a further question which relates to proportionality as well. Um, and he states that the proportionate, that, that the response from the government is actually disproportionate to the threat. It seems to me from, from the comments that Dahlia was making is that there are actually two reasons. One reason was to prevent a protest, but the other reason was actually to prevent the conveyance of images of government atrocities against its citizens. So is that the sort of, how does that fit in with the pattern of activities that you've seen across the world? Right. I mean, I think if you, if you think about all of the effects of a, um, of a network shutdown, you know, whatever the justification governments are giving, when you close down a communications network, it's affecting all users. Um, it's not targeted to particular individuals or, or particular activities. It's a blanket shutdown that prevents um, both the you know, political protest and organizing, news reporting, um, getting information to the outside world about whatever is going on, but also things, very basic things like commerce and in emergency situations, people contacting their family members to let them know they're okay or accessing um, information about uh, you know, what is going on in their situation um, that, is, that is causing this sort of local crisis. So I think when we're thinking about questions of proportionality um, and, and proportionality being key in any kind of restriction on free expression that governments implement, um, it is incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to justify um, shutting down communications networks uh, as a proportionate response to any kind of threat. Yes. There's actually a... Oh, I mean, I was actually going to throw to Alex and just checking with him. Is there ever a situation when... A sh Alex? Is there ever a situation when a shutdown is appropriate or proportionate? Uh, I don't think so. Even if you are dealing with, uh, for example, a legitimate threat, uh, or you have a, a assembly that is not a peaceful assembly, uh, and you want to stop that assembly, um, 
in the context of that threat, for example, you are going to have the threat to loss of life, so you're going to need emergency services, you're going to need coordination of the response, so I think regardless of the threat, and especially if, if there, for example, there was the example of a terrorist attack. So um, if you shut down the network, but the terrorist attack still happens and an ambulance can't come. Um, so no. Dali, is there ever a situation when a network shutdown is appropriate? I'm just going to go down the line. And it's a yes or no. <laughs> Never. OK. Eve, and you'll obviously have the opportunity to talk more. No? I would say no, and, and just uh, to pull a quote from the 2011 Joint Declaration on Freedom of Expression from the four special rapporteurs, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, Frank LaRue, and from the um, Organization of American States, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, um, they very clearly state that cutting off access to the internet or parts of the internet for whole populations or segments of the public can never be justified, including on public order or national national security grounds. The same applies to slowdowns on the internet or parts of the internet. Okay. And Moise? Um, I would say no, sure, but uh, can I comment further? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know that uh, in Tunisia we never had a shutdown of, of, of the internet, but we had uh, a Tunisian internet agency which, which was uh, uh, which, which, which owns the platform that all the traffic of Tunisia is routed via. So all the traffic of Tunisia routed via the platform uh, of, of ITI. So it could be very easily done during the regime and b b before the revolution. And we try to make things better now because we try to open and to have all these uh, regulatory obligations to the operators, including Orange. Orange has a license in my country and is obliged to route all his traffic, its traffic via ITI. So if ITI shut down the routers, all the operators, all the telecom operators, ISP, cannot really route any traffic then to the international field. So shutdown is feasible since a long time ago in Tunisia, but never happened. Uh, we had a rumor uh, late, uh, recently, we had a rumor that uh, because of uh, a problem with ITI and Orange, and the rumor said, okay, and uh, they, they, people said in the street that uh, ITI will shut down all the interfaces with Orange, so Orange will be cut down from the internet. It was really an untrue information, and we saw, and at that time, the, the, this showed how much disruptive of the services is really could damage the, econ the economy also. Because people start to worry about, people went to Orange and asked them to, 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 to cancel the, the contract and to resign to contract. It's really, really damaging the, the economy and the system. Whether it's true or untrue, like, like we have in, in my country. So uh, today, I think is, uh, we have to ask further questions, because you see these this, this, this shutdowns in countries where there is no internet exchange point. Normally, when we see, uh, we see these this, uh, shutdowns in countries where they are only monopoly over international IP transfer services. So the question will be, we need, if we, know, we, we want to to, to avoid shutdowns, it's not just to educate people and, and, and enforce capacity or maybe ask the government to do, to not do so, but it, it, it is now to how to reform the system, the model of the internet connectivity in, in that country, in those countries, in order to avoid any shutdowns happening in the future, because the government can decide uh, whatever they want uh, for, for, for special events or for special, like, like uh, we, see, we, we saw in Iraq or Sina and, uh, and in Egypt and also in, uh, in Syria, uh, this happened. So governments are capable today. They have in their minds to shut down the services when they, they are threats. So our duty today, I think, is just to, to push those governments and to push those countries to have a good reforms on the internet connectivity and to avoid any disruption in the future. So uh, the last comment, and I, uh, yeah, is about uh, the wicket. You know, in the World Conference for International Telecommunication, we have the ITR. Of course, it's not signed by developed countries, but uh, the countries that signed the ITR uh, obliged uh, uh, have, have asked the ITU and, and the all member states to have in the preamble something related to a right of access to member states besides human rights languages in the preamble. This is really important because those countries, and I remember Sudan was one of the countries that advocated this, uh, this, uh, this uh, language in the preamble. So they think that uh, 
the shutdown came from outside of the country, but the shutdown happened inside the country. So the treaty won't really be a safeguard for, the, for any shutdowns in the future, because you see that. So it's, it's not just a right of access to, to, the, to, the, to the member state, but the right of access to people. And uh, this is very important. And uh, here we can get back to Frank Larue's remark about uh, internet access as a human right. So uh, I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm sure that if it is a human right, the government could decide to shut down any service in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, um, Moes, for, for, for raising those issues. Because I think many of us have considered this issue of network shutdowns in terms of a policy response. Um, but there's also a technical response as well. And I think that perhaps, Alex, at some point you could also talk about the civil society response to uh, a network shutdown in terms of mesh networking, whereby there is an access point with, to the community. And then even in the context of a corporate or government-led shutdown, you have a civil society um, mesh network of blackout resilient technology which is set up to respond to that. Um, but first I might just um, jump over to Eve because Eve, um, um, it would be good to get a sense from you hearing about some of the issues, how the telecom sector has responded. Um, Eve's a, the um, the spokesperson, chairperson of the Industry Dialogue, uh, which has 10 of the world's largest telecoms um, as part of it. And it, it has established a set of guiding principles which deal with exactly these issues. Um, and it's interesting to see that as part of those guiding principles, the balance of the telco sector in responding to the request from governments, um, principles um, based on on the, the guiding principles from, from RUGI and at the same time also referring to the ITU and the ITU actually authorises stoppages, shutdowns and disruptions on behalf of the telcos. So it would be good to hear in the context of what you've heard and how the telco sector is actually responding to this in a real sense, not in a policy sense but in a real sense as well. Definitely. Uh, as you said, I represent the ID um, that was born about in March with the principal last year and we just uh, have a, um, a blog that just appeared two, two days ago so if you want to read uh, about our principles but to answer the question let me let me try to explain how we do operate in different countries and tell you uh, what we are facing uh, in, in, in the terms of shutdowns uh, the difference with an internet company is that we do operate within the country. We have thousands of people on the ground. We have billions of dollars of, of technical equipment on the ground. Uh, we deal with government as real stakeholders. We're not just outside the country and decide if yes or not. We can do things like shut down blocking or filtering. I'm going to remove the question. We can do everything. Okay, we hold all the technology, so it's easy for us to do. But on the same time, as I told you, since we are part of the economy of every country in which we operate, customers, we are facing them face-to-face -face regularly, which means the main part of our business is taking care of privacy, of freedom of expression, and all those things that we guarantee to our customers but now we are facing uh, uh, governments, and, and uh, you saw that um, um, the, the rule of telcos was an empty chair up to now. That's why we gathered into the industry dialogue to try to be a lever to answer governments in every single country in which we operate. We do not have the same specific problems in every single country. They are all different. One of the good levers we can use in terms of grievance mechanism is to use and share our best practice when we face such demands from governments. Can I just ask you there, in terms of the industry dialogue, part of its purpose is um, to demonstrate learning. To, dem to demonstrate learning that amongst the sector. So, Absolutely. So Absolutely. I think one thing would be very useful and to pick up on Dalia's point is we just don't know. Like we have no sense of what the telcos are doing um, and what their relationship with the state is. So, so getting a better sense from the industry dialogue 
uh, I think would be very useful to demonstrate that learning. And also just to pick up on your point about how you as a group are able to respond to countries, it would be good to hear from you whether the dialogue has responded as a group to particular instances of shutdown, to use the weight of all of those companies yeah, to respond to okay. individual you're, governments. You're, you're going too far. We're not yet there. Well, let me let me try to to explain what we're doing in terms of sharing best practice. You heard the Sudan case a few minutes ago. Uh, let me let me share with you one or two other uh, examples. Please, thank you. Uh, Egypt. Egypt, uh, we were asked to shut down by the government to shut down uh, the, the mobile network. We were forced to during the revolution. And, and we went one step further in, in which the government asked us to send SMS in the glory of the former government. We refused. The day after, military entered our CEO's office in Egypt and, and armed uh, people forced, forced them to do so. Uh, what we could obtain from the military was to have the SMS send and sign the army so that we were not uh, responsible for what was written within the SMS, but we had to. One of the principles of the ID is to protect our people on the ground as one of the f most important principles. So that's one case. Uh, and we ensure transparency. I'm talking to you about this case now, today. This is transparency. We can do it. Why we can do it? It's because the government is not in place anymore. Uh, other cases where we have to, we are forced to do things and the government is still in place, we can be uh, dragged down before events, during events, and after events. So it's a very difficult position. Let me share another one, just to, to see how the situation can be different. Uh, it happened uh, a few weeks, a few months ago, in a country in, in um, uh, South America. Um, where the president said he's going to nationalize one of the private telco because he was not answering fast enough to the demand of the government to, to provide information on people. Okay, so this is what we're facing. We are, as I said, we are inside countries. We do have <coughs> many people on the ground and, 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 and we do provide one of the most important things we're doing when, once we are inside a country is our corporate social responsibility. We do provide social contracts to our people. We do uh, uh, provide help to education to, to, to have them understand what is telecommunication. We do uh, provide health care. We are uh, a huge taxpayer, which is very different from an internet company which is operating uh, from I don't know where which is not on site. So it could be a leverage from the government to have us do things, or you could think that it could be also a leverage for us to refuse to do things, but it doesn't work this way. Does the industry dialogue have an internal policy across all of the telcos which advises them on how to deal precisely with government responses, uh, or re government requests, I should say. Part of the guiding principles that you've put forward talk about the training, for example, of staff, so that they understand what is an appropriate request, how to process it, and, in, and the mechanism by which it should go all the way up to the board yeah. in order to determine if, an appropriate, if a shutdown is appropriate. Given also, just before your earlier comment about there is never a situation in which a shutdown should take place, how do you reconcile that? Okay. In terms of, of uh, uh, having people uh, educated in our own companies all around the world, because we do operate all around the world, we are in the process of doing it. It's, as I told you, it's very recent. So we are rolling out most of those uh, principles on education. Uh, but we do have the basic processes. We have whistleblowing, we have uh, many things for grievance mechanism to, to you know, processes for, uh, uh, for those things. And so I'm not afraid of, of putting in place independent uh, way of, of, you know, telling people and having the whole thing uh, 
okay. uh, moving on. Thank you. I might just throw to the audience and see if there's any thoughts, comments, questions from anyone, um, particularly if there are other examples of network shutdowns that you'd like to explain to the panel or um, to get a response from either from us or from anyone else in the room. Well, good morning. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, well, there have been a lot of shutdowns or kill switches, as it is called in the United States, since 2005 in Nepal, up to this year, 2013, one in Venezuela, one in Sudan. Always on behalf of the national security, which is a very broad concept, right? For non-Western nation states, it's, we can say it's a national rising. Could you, would Western, you mind speaking up a little bit? Oh, sorry. Thank you. For Western nation states who also consider a shutdown, it's also a matter of national security, but in the form of a cyber attack or a terrorist attack. And now, for, from the empirical evidence, the countries that actually did it, Nepal, Myanmar, Egypt, Libya, Syria, and Venezuela, the first point of attack is the internet service provider, right? They threaten, they told them that they have to disconnect all the portals. If the country has an internet exchange point, then the next thing they do is to go and affect the internet exchange point, disconnecting the routers. So if we know that this is possible, like they are constantly doing this because it's been happening often and more often, is there any technical prevention that uh, can be in place to avoid that? Because it's, it's just a matter of time because it happens again. Thank you. Moes, do you want to take up the question of a technical response? Yes. Uh, it is very important, as I mentioned before, that if you have a shutdown, if you have a, kidding, um, a point where we can shut down the internet in a country, it is for a reason, you know, that, for example, you know, in my country during uh, the regime, the previous regime, the former regime, we say we have ITI as a killer switch. So everything could be shut down from the ITI in, in, when, when it deals with Internet. Uh, this is very, very complicated because you need to move smoothly. You know, we cannot really say, okay, ITI can be abolished and uh, say, okay, let's, move, let's open the system and let Orange, for example, rule the traffic alone and also whatever we want. It's, we, we are in the process. We took, it, we took more than two years to transform, to, to, to eliminate the, the obligations in the, in, in, in the license for the operators. And, uh, we, and also we're working for the internet exchange point in order to keep the value for the country. So it is, it is not just a decision, it's a process, and, and we need to, to get it step by step. It's not something that we can avoid the shutdowns in something like uh, this. We say, okay, let's abolish everything and so on. If we abolish the ITI after the revolution, that means that we shut down the internet. It is very easy. You know, all the traffic of Tunisia is routed via our equipment. So if we, if we abolish the ITI as, an, as a company, that means that internet is off for, the, for, for Tunisia. And now we, we're working on different reforms on this. But uh, it, you have to know that when we deal with shutdown also, it is that because the government and the state and my government want to control the, uh, the internet. It's not the, the same when we deal with telephony or deal the ITU, ITR and so on. With the internet is different. So the government wants to keep some control on the internet. And it, as you mentioned, it is of course for national reasons, national security reasons. And this is one of the important things that we have need to, to educate and to, 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 to build capacity and, 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 and to try to explain things very differently to, to, to the government official today. They are in their minds to, get, to, to, to cut things when they are threats. This is not true. This is not, not, not good for, for the economy. It's not also appropriate to combat uh, terrorism, for example, or to combat any kind of threats that you are facing. Tunisia is facing a lot of threats today, and uh, I, actually we are really, uh, how to say, uh, willing to not see any shutdowns, whether national or regional. We don't want to see that. We don't see any, any shutdowns during the revolution, and we don't want to see shutdowns in Tunisia, actually, whether in the west or on the northwest of Tunisia, where there is some terrorists. Um, I'm not sure exactly what question I'm responding to now. I'm not actually asking about uh, the 
preparation. Um, I, I'd like to comment on that, the, the preparation for future shutdowns, especially from the perspective of the civil society. When this happened in, in Sudan three weeks ago, of course, we were not prepared for such a long uh, shutdown, and we went up and dug solutions that were given to other countries like Egypt um, when it happened. And I have to say, when, when we're now trying to prepare for it because we realized that the solutions that were given to Egypt were not good for our uh, country specific for, for in our case. For instance, things like um, the, the dial-up modem solution, it does not work for most African countries who skipped the landline uh, <laughs> and, and just went totally to the like, mobile revolution. Um, uh, another solution was like the speak-to-tweet service that was uh, created by Google during that time. Some of those numbers were not active and we had to reach out to Google so that they can be act reactivated. Now we are testing them, but at the time when we needed them, they were not working. So I think if there are countries that are very repressive and think that this is a possibility, that there should be a plan B uh, prepared by the civil society ahead of time. And now we hope to be working with, for instance, Access's uh, desk line um, to prepare something that is Sudan specific. So over to Alex, but uh, if, like, what we're hearing here is actually the alternatives beyond the telcos, like that civil society is basically saying, if you can't provide us with the communication tools, then, and the networks and the platforms will actually make our own. Alex. Okay, um, I, I would agree with Dahlia, there's, there's not really an alternative. Um, I, I think the other danger is a, a big issue at the Internet Governance Forum is the balkanization of the Internet. So, I mean, depending on the context, obviously when an alternative is really needed, um, then we must go for it. Um, just to comment on speak, speak to tweet was inherently very insecure because it's, it was just a, a voice line which could be quite easily eavesdropped and much more easily identified than bits of data uh, going across a network. I think it all depends on the topology of the country, of the uh, also the topology of the network infrastructure. So in, in some cases there can be alternatives. I, I'm, I'm not a technical expert but I am quite excited about mesh networking um, and, and I, I don't think it's an alternative to the internet but you could think of it as an alternative uh, form of communication within communities which can be useful. We don't always have to use the internet to communicate. Um, my other fear is that we are perhaps more familiar with the security of the internet um, than we are with the security of a new system that is not as ubiquitous and uh, we, so it, it, yeah, it depends on the developers, it depends how open the process is, it depends how new the system is and what exact kind of system we're talking about. Thank you. Um, could I just clarify to the stenographer that I am Alex Kominos, uh, the gentleman before is Eve from Orange Telecom. Thank you. Can I ask a question for those, for those of us who don't know what mesh networking, if you can explain more? Yeah, as far as I understand, uh, mesh networking is um, a kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking that can be done in different ways. It, it's usually off a wireless network, but uh, there's no centralized point in the network, so you can uh, distribute wireless infrastructure throughout a country um, or throughout a small area, so it's a good way of um, kind of extending the connectivity of the internet, and it's a good way of, of having um, a more an internet with more autonomous parts. Uh, it's also a good way of, of sharing files and doing many interesting things. Uh, I understand in Holland they've got uh, mesh networking, not as alternative to the internet, but just as technical community and civil society uh, playing around with, with file sharing. Uh, there's also a very interesting uh, mobile app called, uh, I think it's called Mesh Potato, but correct me if I'm wrong, but you can turn uh, quite a few Android phones with a customized operating system into units of the mesh network. Um, and I believe uh, Ushahidi is also working on some, some wireless technology that, that can extend, uh, that, that can make access points to extend a network. And uh, it could possibly be turned into a mesh, but the, the concept is quite broad. Uh, it's Lob saying in the, off in, in the room, yeah, hi, how are you? Um, it would be good to hear from you perhaps a little bit about the experience in Tibet um, because I know that some of these issues are very relevant there as in Tibet. 
Uh, and also just to pick up on this response uh, from Alex about what some of the civil society response is to a network shutdown. Sure. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Lobson, um, here from Tibet Action Institute. So in terms of what's happening inside Tibet, is because of uh, a repressive re regime is under control, the, some of the options are not available and sometimes we have to look at outside the box, not from a technical point of view, just from a communication point of view. So if you look at what's happening right now, uh, this was a protest on October 6th in a, in a place called Dili, which is under the Tibet Autonomous Region. So there was a flag raising ceremony that the people protested against. Because of that, there was a total network blackout in that particular region. So the only option was to get the information out, was for people to travel to other parts of the country where there was network access. So in such a case, uh, and in such a country, there is a totalitarian regime. Uh, I'm not sure how we can actually work with the telcos in terms of that. How do we actually make that accessible? And I think that's the problem that we do face in repressive regimes. One of the interesting things that I recall from France Telecom's response in Cote d'Ivoire was to proactively, in the context of um, a political crisis, to provide free credits. Um, is that a one-off? Is that something that major telecoms would be interested in doing, in proactively providing free internet, free telephone uh, credits in order for the community to be able to speak in what Rob Sang is describing, which is essentially a political environment where the government and the citizens are in serious and, and uh, sustained conflict. Yeah, no, <clears throat> I will answer that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, our main customers are the people and not the governments, basically. So we want to serve them. But as I explained to you, we are you know, the piece of meat in the sandwich in between the demand from the people then we, of course, we are opening everything we can do, technology, prices, access, everything we're ready to do if we are not forced to do differently. So if you look at the OECD framework, I'm just going to read a paragraph from that. It says that states failure either to enforce relevant domestic laws or to implement international human rights obligations or the fact that it may act contrary to such laws or international obligations does not diminish the expectations that enterprises respect human rights. So we're also seeing many companies that are outside the industry dialogue, both companies that are inside the industry dialogue out and outside the industry dialogue that are not adhering to, those princi to that principle. Um, so I wonder um, if there's any perspective from the panel as to how do we actually engage with companies that don't have even a policy with which to break internally in the sense that many companies um, which are not necessarily European companies have got and are also owners of um, the, the telcos or part owners of the telcos. How do we actually get them to move the dial? Because what we're trying to do here in a sense at the, at the Internet Governance Forum is to create norms. Unfortunately, a norm that is being created at the moment is that network shutdown is okay. And so there are competing forces. How do we tip some of those companies to realize that this is a norm that's unacceptable, inconsistent with international human rights, and also bad for their business? Uh, I would like to answer that question. Um, well, first of all, in Egypt, I'm not sure if it worked, but uh, after the shutdown, there was a campaign uh, by, well, I guess, just general internet users, you could call it civil society, to not pay the bills of the uh, mobile and internet operators um, as a response to, you're supposed to provi provide me a service and you, you cut it off. Uh, of course, it's, it's very hard for civil society to, to lobby at a national level if they're dealing with a telecom operator that can just have their license. It's not only a shareholding issue, but in, in any country, a, a license is granted for, for many reasons, and a license has to be granted, and a license can be taken away. So I also think you need to look at shareholding structures. For example, if you're dealing with, and this is the case in many countries, a telco that um, has a mother company domiciled somewhere else, then I think you should also network with civil society in that country. Uh, so, for example, if you have um, Zain based in Sudan, then um, where's the mother company of Zain? Kuwait. Kuwait, yes. Then you should uh, link up with Kuwaiti civil society 
and um, then second, just to also make telco companies that they're aware that their governments can change. <laughs> the government that comes in next might be a bit pissed off with the, the role that the telco played and could very, cancel, could very well cancel their license. Uh, I mean, I, I warned a friend who worked at a telco in Egypt, uh, who worked at a South African telco that, that had operations, um, about this type of thing, and he said, well, business is business, but um, you know, after the revolution, I pointed out that this could be very bad for your business. Mm. Let's pick up on this, the whole spectrum. Actually, you touched on the point of operating license, and we're going to go all the way in this panel to remedy. Emma, do you want to comment on the nature of the relationship that's established at the starting point? So when the telco is entering into the sector or into the, into the jurisdiction, what is the nature of that relationship? How, is the, how does the button, perhaps you're not the right, necessarily the right person, perhaps it's for Eve, what is happening, or to, even to Yochai who's, who's, who's in the audience, how do you actually create a, uh, an environment where the telco and the state are negotiating on a, perhaps an even playing field and that there is some kind of, some kind of provisions in the operating license uh, which prevent the state from having that kind of unilateral authority uh, over, over the telco. Hi, my name is Yochai Benavi. I'm the policy director at Access to work with Brad. Um, I, I think that here it's worthwhile to bring up the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And, and I think that the, the GPs did two really important things. One is to sort of, they, in the, this comes from the work of John Ruggie, the former um, UN Special Rapporteur on Transnational Corporations and Human Rights. Um, and it sort of lays out a, a framework that says that um, states have an, uh, a duty to protect human rights, corporations have a responsibility to respect human rights, and both must provide uh, access to remedy. Um, and so I think the first thing that this did is one to sort of say that any, anyone who says that companies don't have an obligation or a responsibility to respect human rights don't have a leg to stand on anymore. And two is that both um, states and, and uh, private actors have a responsibility to provide remedy, which we've been kind of dancing around here a little bit. Um, and, you know, within this, you know, I think when people think of remedy, um, they tend to immediately think about reparations. And I, I think that if you read the guiding principles and if you read uh, our telco remedy plan, um, there's, a, there's a wide range of remedies actually available, both in terms of substance and procedure. Um, and so in procedure, um, Eva has talked about some of this. It's about having um, grievance mechanisms that are transparent and they're accessible. It's about having, uh, making sure that there are not reprisals against people making use of those operating, uh, those grievance mechanisms um, and so forth. But, and then I think the, the most, sort of the first thing though that Ruggie said in terms of substance is a promise of non-repetition. Um, we understand that there are times where staff is at risk, where there is infrastructure that is at risk, and we've seen, unfortunately, examples of when telcos have pushed back, and we want telcos to push back, but that there have been unfortunate um, sort of where staff have been killed, and we, we, I mean, we understand that there's obligations of the company to its employees as well. Um, but the promise of non-repetition is, is critical and sort of really putting that out there. Um, and likewise, I think transparency around what occurred. Um, I think frequently we see very, rarely do we see an immediate response from the telecos to sort of say, this is what happened, you know, this is the nature, this is the statute under which it was authorized or is under our, our operating license. And transparency is itself a form of remedy because by disclosing what happened and the nature of what happened, it really allows the victims to uh, much more easily seek redress. And particularly because the human rights abuses that telcos are um, frequently implicated in come at the behest of states, non-judicial remedy is especially important. Um, and I just want one more point, and, and as, <laughs> I'm commenting here as an audience member, um, is, is the notion of operating licenses comes up a lot. I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of times the corporate response is, well, you know, we have this operating license that the states basically get to put whatever they want into. And I think that 
we need to be doing, and perhaps this is a, a fruitful area for civil society and the corporate sector to work together, is to get more transparency around those operating licenses. What are the clauses in them? Um, and what are the sort of specific pieces that we can sort of work on to try and um, improve? And, and Mars is doing sort of leading work in this in the Tunisian context to try and improve those operating licenses. Um, and I don't know, Mars, if <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot, if, you know, if, if it's possible for Tunisia, for example, to publish an operating license. It's taking out some of the, the trade secrets secrets, of course, and sort of the exact pricing, but to really get transparency around the operating licenses, um, I think would be a huge um, step forward and a fruitful area for collaboration. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I remember the, the discussion that's held also in Tunis in the conference, Freedom Online, about transparency. Yes, of course, it is a key issue. and. Uh, this is what is required from the government today and for after the revolution. It's really, really something that we, we believe that is something that we could be much more transparent about the, all the process and uh, what we really happened before and uh, what kind of um, uh, intentions can the governments have when they deal with uh, some strikes or revolution or whatever we can call it. So I think it's uh, important to mention about transparency. But uh, you have to agree that um, we need to agree about a process. It is a process. We cannot really have transparency like this. It's, we need time. We need to educate people. We need to get a lot of awareness from the government side. And uh, a lot of work has been done for this, at least for the civil society. So, so if I could just, I mean, I, I understand that there's a process within the government into, particularly around an operating license, which is has historically been extremely secret. Um, but Eve, I might want to ask you the same sort of follow-up question. You know, in terms of both a transparency report around the requests that you get from government, this is something particularly the internet platforms have been doing, but I'm not aware of any telco in the world that publishes um, a transparency report around the requests it gets from government. Um, and around, you know, what, what are actually the confidentiality clauses that are in these operating licenses that are prohibiting you from talking about them? Okay. Um, as, I, as I explained, we have a different relation with governments than what an internet company has. I mean, the transparency report that Google and others have pulled down these, these uh, last uh, year, uh, we cannot do without the agreement from governments to do so, even in France. Talking to France, uh, every single demand that we are getting from the French government, we cannot report without their agreement. Um, whatever you describe uh, 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 is within the, the access paper uh, about grievance mechanism and remedy that I read carefully. We, of course, as telco, uh, agree on all of them. Uh, uh, the good sign, the good thing is the ID is born. And it's only, as I told you a few months ago, we're trying to get together in order to be a lever toward government to have them agree that we could be at least first step transparent on the thing they're asking us to do. Okay. The other good news is that ID is, n is now uh, sitting on the GNI platform, which means that we have a real dialogue with internet companies that have a lot less tr uh, uh, attachment to government than what we have and hopefully we'll be able to provide uh, the first uh, transparencies coming soon. We are working also with governments to try to help them regulate the process of asking us to do things. And uh, uh, we will start, we were discussing with the Council of Europe this morning, we will of course start to ask uh, government we can talk to easily first, but we hope that those uh, uh, examples will be a, a good way to try to convince other governments to follow the same procedures. But again, everything you said about non-replication, fast route to provide uh, the information, processes to go on the higher level of the company, uh, best practice sharing is, uh, I, I, I explain you two practices today, which is transparency for us, uh, we will do. We've been asked, and I have asked since I'm the chair now, every single industry dialogue country to provide 
uh, examples of, 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 of study of cases in which they had to comply with government requirements. Okay, and we will make sure that in the coming future we will have governments decide to choose between uh, 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 nation security and nation, uh, uh, you know, demands which are not security, basically. Um, it's great to hear that. Um, uh, I, I've put a however there. The however is that um, it, this kind of internal discussion and review of information, I think, is one thing. Um, it also comes back to the point of transparency, which is which relates to, and also to your guiding principles as well, which talks about external third party review on an annual basis. It would be good to hear about the process that's of that. That's the GNI principle, that's not the ID principle, the external review. That's part of the GNI principles and we're not exactly on the same, on the same lever uh, for ID principles. Uh, again, having an external audit on everything we're doing is fine, except it's a different concept in different countries. Yeah. We cannot be dealt as a one company. Uh, no, I understand. Uh, maybe I should restate just to read to you your principle eight, which says report externally on an annual basis and whenever circumstances make it relevant on their progress in implementing the principles and as appropriate on major events occur occurring in this regard. So it was to that point that I was asking you about the annual review or, or the point at which you see a major event in which case a review is, is necessary. Both, both actually. We, we have, uh, as, as big companies, we, are, uh, we have an annual report on um, most of the corporate social responsibility issues all the non-financial issues and now human rights, freedom of speech and privacy is becoming a big part of it. We are, as a national company, audited on this and we will include all those things within our reporting. I'm in charge of this reporting in Orange, so I can guarantee we will report on that. Okay, I look forward to it. Dalia, you look like you've wanted to say something for a while. Uh, I just actually wanted to ask Eve if he had any examples that come to mind from the countries where he's working where there is a positive engagement or relationship with the civil society on issues related to user rights and protection from things like closures or just surveillance or tapping of phones, etc. We have a lot of, of engagement with civil society but there are a lot on, on, on um, social and economic development of the country and, and not at all for the moment on those issues. So let's open up to the audience um, for some further questions or comments. Please. Hi, my name is uh, Shahla Rashid and thank you very much. I would like to begin by thanking the panel. It's a very useful discussion. Uh, unfortunately, the Could you speak up just a little bit? No. Oh yeah, I started by thanking the panel. <laughs> it was a very useful discussion. Thank you. And, uh, but unfortunately, there is no representative from the Indian government, which is what we believed uh, would be the case. A representative from the Indian government. Okay. Uh, there is no one, unfortunately. From, from but, the Indian government? Yeah, so just to share um, the peculiar uh, Indian example, because when we think of network shutdowns and uh, blocking, we, I mean the last countries that come to our mind are those that are democratic and you know have often been praised for having democratic standards and for upholding human rights and democratic principles. But uh, the Indian uh, scenario is more worrisome because, because India has been uh, you know often praised for being a democratic or the largest democracy and for being a pluralistic democracy even under exceptional circumstances. But there have been, a, there have been like a few cases. Uh, can, can I get you just to speak a little closer into the microphone because up here it's really... No? Uh, yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Um, so for example, last year there was, there was a mass blocking of 300 URLs in, uh, following an incident which happened in the Indian city of Bangalore. So there was a mass exodus of northeastern Indians from the south Indian city of Bangalore following uh, ethnic tensions between Muslims and Northeastern uh, Indians in the uh, Northeast. And uh, there were I mean, 300 URLs that were blocked and there was a limitation put on the number of SMS that you could send. 
and uh, the, the, the reason, it was reason that uh, the circulation, I mean, the, the ethnic tensions were caused by the, the ethnic tensions in Bangalore were caused by the circulation of an MMS, which uh, which was basically misleading and fake. Um, but uh, there are other examples as well. So, for example, if they, this is not an open and shut case. In such situations, like the government could make a case that uh, to avoid ethnic tensions, we had to uh, block the internet or block SMS. But there are other examples. So, for example, if you take the specific case of Kashmir, uh, there has been a ban on SMS uh, from prepaid mobile for the last three years. And this was obviously following the protest, and it was reason that uh, people who are uh, like people are organizing via SMS, and uh, that's why there are protests. But the ban was uh, it was never lifted, and uh, there was never any review of what the effectiveness of the ban is. Uh, now, if we look at it from the government's perspective, for one, it's not effective, and uh, I mean, how will the government ever learn from? Uh, in this situation, if there is no review, uh, and even after, I mean, the, even after the ban, I mean, three years into the ban, there still are protests. So, you know, the, the causal relationship that was explained between SMS and protests is that really valid? Um, so, one, I would have liked a comment from the government on that. And uh, another thing is that. Uh, yeah, at, at times it may be necessary as a first response, I mean, the blocking and SMS, but uh, the, the local administrations are given wide powers under, uh, I mean, yes, uh, there, is, there are some emergency provisions like Section 144 and then there are other blocking provisions, uh, under which the government does not have to give any reason, like the, the blocking order does not have to come through a court or uh, any independent authority, or it does not even have to be reviewed. So there are these emergency provisions under which the government can simply block uh, the internet or SMS or any network for that matter. Uh, and following another case uh, this year, which was the hanging of uh, one Kashmiri who was convicted in a parliament attack case, uh, there was a there was a block, like there was, the internet was blocked in Kashmir for six days, and uh, it was circumvented uh, because the Kashmiri diaspora, uh, Kashmiri young people living all over the world, they managed to trend uh, hashtags like Kashmir siege. So that's how it was circumvented. But from the government's perspective, you know, one, it's not effective; it can be circumvented, and we really don't learn from these examples. I mean, what is the best way to deal with protests? Are they important uh, only as a first measure, or is the continued ban important? And like the, the international uh, standards that uh, these measures should be effect should be effective, necessary, and proportionate, restrictive, uh, the least restrictive methods for uh, controlling the situation. Uh, we, we don't see that happening. Like we don't see the application of those principles, or at least a review. That's something you want to Do you have a particular suggestion or recommendation or question for the panel? Um, well, uh, not for the panel per se, but I mean um, for the Indian government in general, uh, a suggestion that there should be like a review process. It, it could either be an independent body or it could be judicially reviewing all these bans say after six months or three months, depending on the severity of the situation. But uh, it's problematic like if, if there is a ban on SMS sent from prepaid mobile for three years. And then 85% of the mobile customers in Kashmir are prepaid customers. Yeah. So there's something that's... Yeah. Just building off of your comments and um, something that, that Brett was saying earlier about there seems to be this emerging norm among governments, at least, that network shutdowns or blocking of mobile communications um, is an acceptable measure. But uh, then we see the, the consensus among this panel that it is never an acceptable measure. Um, and I think we really have a lot of work to do um, in advocacy toward governments from civil society, from industry, um, to really underscore that there, there, the emerging global norm around network shutdown should be that they are, you know, disproportionate and um, not an appropriate limitation on freedom of expression. Um, I think, you know, for for all of the, 
human rights reasons, um, on the way network shutdown limits access to information, but also to make the, the economic arguments, the way that cutting off access to communications networks um, really does harm the economy of a country, and trying to figure out what are all of the different angles um, and, and arguments to present to governments to help demonstrate that not only is it a violation of your people's human rights, it's also in the, uh, not in the best interest of your country economically. Um, and I think we need to start focusing uh, on, you know, governments that are uh, democratic governments that consider themselves typically human rights respecting, but still are taking, um, taking these kinds of measures. We see the discussing the examples of India. We saw um, the Irish government earlier this year introducing into their um, criminal justice uh, act a, a provision for their minister to potentially, in the case of um, national security threats, order a network shutdown. We have an open proceeding in the United States at the Federal Communications Commission still kind of thinking about this issue. Could it ever be legitimate for um, a local or, or federal um, shutdown of communications networks in the United States. The fact that these governments are treating this as an open question, I think, is a big problem. Um, and so that is, I think, certainly one, one of the first places to start with advocacy around shifting what the, the norms that um, governments may seem to be creating amongst themselves um, really are. Yeah, I would say it's a slippery slope. There's a quote that Benjamin Franklin didn't actually say but was attributed to him, but those that would um, give up their freedoms for a little bit of security deserve neither. Um, so I, I think we need to weigh it up, and it's definitely a very slippery slope. Uh, if it is done, you really need to consider the consequences. For example, if you are going to block SMSs that are spreading hate speech, now how do you detect that? You can only detect that through mass surveillance systems. Um, so, and, and, and then if it is done, you really need to have good oversight. For example, and I know it's a very legitimate fear in Kenya, but they had, um, they've had problems in the 2008 elections with, with hate speech and SMS. And what they actually had in the most recent elections was a um, control of what they called mass political messaging. And they, uh, this was a proposal regulation, so investigate whether this happened. but. <coughs> They did it in a very bad way. What happened was that a political party would submit, would give information to a content you know, provider, for example, a bulk SMS company. The content provider would then give it to the mobile operator. The mobile operator was given a list of uh, quite a few criteria, and they had to decide themselves, I think, with under two to three days. They could ask for help from the, uh, an independent commission in Kenya, but only if they wanted to. So you're effectively then getting companies to do the policing with no oversight. And yet one of the requirements was that any political message that wasn't in English or Swahili was not allowed. Um, obviously because like India there are different ethnic communities focused around languages, but in my opinion that's not a solution. And then just lastly, I like the fact that you pointed out it can happen in democracies. And I think this is very tempting in, in democracies as a method of internet control in 2011, um, not throughout the whole country, but in a um, state-administered cell phone network in the underground of the San Francisco rapid transit system um, in order to stop a protest or control a protest, they shut down the cell phone networks. Um, also, um, the Democratic National Convention live stream was shut down by copybots. So this is an accident, but these are these little robots on the internet that police caught what they think is a copyright infringement. These, these bots made a mistake. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then also there was the British government after the Arab Spring when they had these, well, during the Arab Spring when they also had the riots in Britain, um, they were considering shutting down BlackBerry Messenger. So your point about this happening in democracies is very valid and something we need to think about. Thank you. No, it's an excellent point. There's actually a number of comments from the audience, so perhaps one, two, and then three at the back. Hi. My name is Sanam Saneem and I represent an organization called Bolupi from Pakistan. And um, I was just listening to the panel. One of the, one of the questions that I have from the panel is that, um, I mean, we have consensus on the panel from the civil society and from the government and the telcos that there are no instances where blockage is justifiable, yet we don't hear these examples in the mainstream. There is a, 
the, there's no sharing of information between civil society groups talking about how they are responding to these ad hoc measures. And uh, I feel strongly that while governments around the world are complying with each other and using each other's excuses to replicate those bans, civil society uh, globally is not doing such a great job in sharing that information and then learning from each other's experiences and replicating that. Um, I mean, I could sh go on and share experiences of how we try to resist that, but, and I would love to help other countries who have similar experiences, like for instance India, on how we took the debate from the national security aspect to then diversifying and bringing in, you know, people like teachers or doctors talking about, you know, we had, in one case for instance, uh, we had a gynecologist uh, come to the court during a hearing uh, that a telco was leading to talk about how she lost a patient because the patient could not reach her on the telephone. And that greatly impacted the, the ruling. Um, and I just feel that there are not enough conversation going on because the government do not respond to principles. And that's not just governments in developing countries. Uh, the UN guiding principles, we've been quoting them uh, and we've been pressuring the governments to respond to them, but there is, the principles are there and they look brilliant in theory. There is no practice unless there is pressure. And when governments around the world do it, especially the developing countries, what we hear, uh, the, sorry, especially the democratic countries, uh, the first world countries, what we hear in democratic countries is that, well, if America can shut that down for national security, if the UK can shut down for national security, then why do you think that you living in Pakistan in a developing country can demand more rights? And which is why we need those voices from civil society in the UK and in the US to share that information and to talk about, you know, the fact that they are talking and even though that doesn't get amplified. Um, and just a short comment on the UN guiding principles. We've been writing letters to the Canadian government on the presence of net sweeper in Pakistan. And we wrote uh, another letter to the High Commissioner in the UK. We both have responded. Both High Commissioners have responded. And both of them have just given a very morally cuddled letter saying, yes, we believe in the UN guiding principles, but now it's your duty to see your government's responsibility to see uh, what may or may not happen of the, with that technology being used in Pakistan. So unless there's a consolidated effort and noise being made with civil society around the world, let's say UK, Canada, and Pakistan about such a technology being used and their government being complacent, governments are not interested in complying to these guiding principles. So in the room we have India, Pakistan, Tibet, Sudan and probably one or two others. Um, so after this meeting, it would be great if you guys could share those conversations and the US as well um, in order to see how there might be some further pressure. Remember also that Eve is here. I mean, he's the, the, the 10 telcos between them probably have two billion customers, I would say, or more, two or three billion customers. Um, so you should speak to Eve because it's very possible, like we talk about individual instances and of course we've talked about remedy for people who are impacted directly by a network shutdown, but if we can shift the policies of the companies, um, then we can influence the human rights of two or three billion people potentially and if we can also activate those companies to be advocates against or to the governments, then we have a very powerful partnership. Um, let's hear from you sir. Yes, um, I'm Bastian, I'm from the Netherlands, um, I'm an entrepreneur, I work at a telecom company in the Netherlands, um, and everything has been going on about governments shutting down network and stuff, but I think, you know, um, terrorists can shut down ex entire internet exchanges, for example, with physical damage, but also by, for example, DDoS, and that is way more difficult to stop via diplomatic ways, um, and what do you think about that, for example, terrorists? organization shooting down entire networks. Does anybody want to take that question on? So it's the use of terrorist terrorist networks, terrorists using the networks in order to plan an attack. Yeah, or terrorists shooting down entire networks. Would anybody on the panel or an audience member like to respond to that? Alex? T well, sorry, I'm a bit confused. You talked about DDoS and then you talked about using terrorist networks to plan an attack. I think these are two very different things. 
I mean, terrorists will also use the air to plan an attack. You know, uh, molecules vibrate in the air, and <laughs> it's a means of communication. And and I think this can be discussed in a surveillance issue. But you weigh up whether you want mass dragnet surveillance, and terrorists are always going to use networks. The second issue was DDoS. I think you kind of misunderstood my question. I mean, terrorists shooting down networks. For example, we had a spam house attack in the Netherlands, and terrorists fire a DDoS, shoot down an entire internet exchange because it just crashed. Well, I don't think we've ever seen this happen, that terrorists shut down a network. Um, and I, I think that we've never seen anyone die from a net well, well, we have seen people die from lack of emergency services. But uh, to I, th I think DDoS is terrible. DDoS is a shutdown. DDoS can be censorship. Uh, but to call something terrorism, terrorism is a very particular thing which I find it very problematic to apply in the cyber domain. So uh, I'll wait to see if it happens. But I think that terrorism involves the threat of loss of life to people, not just computer infrastructure. Thank you. But I do think it's an interesting point which I take, which is we've been talking about shutdowns on behalf of by the government or by the corporations. The question which he's raising relates to is there a non-state actor or a third party that can be responsible for shutting down the networks and what, the, what is the response to that? Thank you for raising that issue. So at the back. Yeah, um, Patrick from Fiji. My concern with this discussion is um, from the operator's point of view, the telcos and the service providers, the ISPs. Um, you know, you, you ask the question, when is it appropriate for a shutdown? From an operator's point of view, you know, um, you know, the obvious answer is, you know, um, uh, in the defense of human life. If there's people there with, uh, if the government is there with guns, uh, pointing at the, you know, the network operators, you know, then it's appropriate for the network operator to make the decision to take down the network because they are, uh, their lives are threatened. Um, you know, that that really raises the question that um, these these providers of these services you're talking about. Um, that, that internet is a human rights, but because of the nature of the infrastructure in the internet, there are gateways in all of these countries, and as long and, and the protectors of these gateways, the operators of these gateways, are very important players. If you're going to say that uh, internet is a human right, then are the providers of those human rights entitled to special protection? Um, you know, can they be protected from um, uh, legal action? Uh, for instance, government comes in and says, uh, tells the operator to um, to shut down the internet, and you know they, as the as the authority, as the government, they can threaten incarceration or or other such things. So, should the uh, the providers of that service have some some protection from uh, those types of threats? Thank you. Okay, so we just have, um, I think, one last comment at the back. Yes, hello, my name is Caroline Tengmi. I work for the Association of Progressive Communications. Um, I just wanted to ask, because um, you made an interesting comment about the fact that mobile networks in, in Africa are basically the main key points of entry for ac internet access. and like uh, most operators do operate in many countries in the continent, like MTN is almost everywhere, Orange is also <laughs> almost everywhere. Um, so I'm wondering at one point if it's not, if, if you've tried to um, discuss those issues, if there's been some attempts to discuss those issues on a regional or on a continental level, and if, if that's not the way to do advocacy in terms of like, um, of, of network uh, disruptions in a way. Thank you. Maybe a quick answer. Uh, and maybe uh, also a final comment and I'll just run down the panel. Okay. Uh, we are on the way of discussing with, with our countries in Africa and, and elsewhere also. Uh, for the moment it's been a very corporate type of issue that we will roll down in, in the coming months, yeah. Final comment. Uh, let me open the future on a final comment. Uh, since, uh, in terms of ID and GNI, since we realized that uh, it was such an important issue that we did not have our hands 
free enough to to behave the way we we want to behave in terms of human rights. Uh, let me open the future and say ID exists now, and and we will try to answer most of the questions that were asked today. We need to convince government. We need to open as wide as we can, take all the dialogue with civil society and government, and hopefully there will be an after. Uh, um, revolution and after uh, Northern Leagues, there will be an after everything, and I hope we're going the right way. Yeah, one thing I definitely took out from this conversation um, and the comments from Emily and Alex, especially, is that from a civil society perspective, we uh, maybe the way forward is. Um, more advocacy, more strategic advocacy especially, both with uh, governments and explaining to them um, the holistic impact of shutdowns, uh, as well as advocacy with um, the global civil society where uh, operators that are operating in and at the local context are operating also at the international context and reaching out to the global civil society for pressure and uh, on the, uh, or better dialogue with uh, with the telecoms. So that's, that's for me probably one thing I definitely took out. Yeah, I just think we should also extend, the, this was a great discussion, we should extend the concept in our minds of a shutdown to also look at the quality of the service. Um, and that can perhaps be the more long-term systemic, less noticeable and um, not, not necessarily less sinister thing, but less easy to realize that it's sinister. If you compare the quality of debate here, with regards to the quality of debate at the Baku Internet Governance Forum, at the Baku Internet Governance Forum there was no kind of back chatter Twitter channels because the internet had such terrible quality. So if you also compare the terrible broadband that exists in many of these countries, it's, it's not in government's interests often to, well, repressive governments to get their citizens online with good quality broadband. Thank you. That's, and th thanks for raising that. I think we've talked about shutdowns, but one of the, the, the kind of trends that we're seeing is that it's not necessarily as black and white as a shutdown, but it's actually a throttle. And I think the young lady from India uh, gave examples of that. Um, Emma? Sure. I'll, I'll just echo Dahlia's point um, that, you know, just as the, the telecoms have their industry dialogue, we really need a civil society dialogue along these points. Um, and that I think there's very much that we could accomplish both by having better coordination information sharing among civil society and then being able to cross talk across uh, stakeholder groups and um, you know really work to shift this norm um, away from from acceptance of shutdowns thank you uh, my last comment is uh, if you want to prevent shutdowns if you want if you don't, if you don't want the government to, to, tomorrow to, to, to shut down the internet, you have to work with businesses, you have to work with operators, you have to work, we have to trust people that work for the internet today in order to prevent any decision made by, the, by, in, by, by any government related to shutdowns. It's really, we experienced this with, with, with ITI. Today we work with the society and we, we believe that society is helping us to, to, to prevent any shutdowns. ITI is a killer switch, but we never, never, never cut the internet. So thank you very much. Can you thank the panel for me? Um, very much appreciate your being here and thanks a lot to the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you.